Jessica's case is a remarkable story of a, a woman's commitment to having a family and to overcoming um, really difficult circumstances. She came to us after being diagnosed uh, with breast cancer and um, was facing um, treatment that would potentially jeopardize her ability to be a mom and to have a family. Um, many of the, the therapies, um, while very successful in treating cancer, can impact the, the egg quality or egg number or a woman's ability for future fertility. So we met her after her initial diagnosis, uh, talked to her about the options for fertility preservation, and um, then pursued uh, an in vitro fertilization cycle where we uh, gave her medications to stimulate the ovaries, uh, harvested her eggs, and put those eggs in the freezer uh, while she was undergoing uh, her treatment. Jessica's case is a little unusual in that the initial decision was to harvest and freeze the eggs. Egg freezing is um, now commonplace, but it's only become that in literally the last uh, uh, few years, even um, last several months, um, has it become standard of care. Um, egg freezing is more difficult for a variety of reasons than embryo freezing. Uh, her uh, case actually involved both, which is the unusual component. We froze her eggs uh, when she'd completed her therapy, uh, thanks to the great care of our oncology team, and was ready to pursue motherhood. We thawed the eggs, uh, fertilized them with her spouse's uh, sperm, um, and had planned to do an embryo transfer. Um, occasionally, the endometrium is not ready. Um, we have several markers that we use for receptivity, um, just trying to give the patients the optimum chance for pregnancy. Um, because of the uterus at that time was not ready, we then um, refroze essentially now the embryos. Um, so the eggs were frozen, thawed, fertilized, cultured in the lab for a few days, and then refrozen as embryos. Uh, a few months later, her uterus um, responded beautifully. Um, things were uh, good to go, so the embryos were frozen, were thawed after being frozen, and she had a transfer and uh, a beautiful end result, I might add. The initial consult is absolutely crucial in that we need to see um, the patients, both men and women, who are facing chemotherapy or radiation prior to any treatment. Um, for men, it's much easier to collect sperm and freeze them. They freeze very well. Um, eggs and embryos, on the other hand, require at least two weeks um, time period to prep the ovary, stimulate it with hormones, and then harvest uh, the eggs, which is a fairly simple procedure. There's no incisions. Um, it is an ultrasound-guided essential needle biopsy of the ovary with anesthesia, so the patients are very comfortable. Um, but there's about a two-week delay from the time we first meet until we can potentially put eggs in the freezer or fertilize those eggs and four to five days later, or five to six days later, I should say, uh, freeze the embryos, which are now blastocysts. So an embryo is called a blastocyst on the fifth day. Um, but we're freezing both very successfully uh, now as Jessica's case uh, uh, is a prime example. There are multiple things you can do when someone is facing uh, chemotherapy or radiation um, for whatever reason. Um, you can uh, put them on a special hormone regimen to quiet the ovaries or quiet the testicle so it's less susceptible to the effects of chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, you can harvest, freeze eggs as we did in her case, freeze embryos also as we did in her case. Um, and then in some uh, rare circumstances, we'll actually remove the ovary, freeze it, and then transplant it back to the woman um, uh, later after their treatment is complete. That probably is ideal for young women uh, uh, who have not reached puberty. Uh, we do have uh, um, ongoing research. We are approved to do that down to eight years of age. 
Um, it, it's only beneficial in rare circumstances, but that's available. The final option that, that's available as, uh, as far as ovaries are concerned is a surgical process where we move the ovary out of the pelvis. Uh, some conditions require specific um, pelvic radiation, such as in the past cervical cancer was a prime example. And if the radiation is going to be limited to the pelvis, we can move the ovary out of the pelvis so it's away from the uh, immediate danger. Uh, and then later harvest those eggs uh, to use for um, pregnancy. The most crucial aspect of this actually is probably the counseling, that patients have been given the diagnosis uh, of cancer or other conditions that require chemotherapy or radiation, and it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, they often have many, many questions. Our oncologists do a great job of addressing the, those concerns around the cancer itself, but then there are other things that come up. Quality of life, and many people equate equality with family, and many women equate quality of life with having their own family or motherhood. So um, our, our goal with the Fertility Preservation Program for both men and women, first of all, is assess their risk. Is their, is their treatment like to, likely to impact their future reproduction? And if it is, what options are available to preserve um, or give them a better shot at later reproduction? And then in those cases where they've already had chemotherapy or radiation, um, we talk to them about uh, what can be done after the fact, not only to assess fertility potential, but also to um, help them still achieve a pregnancy if the uh, treatment has impacted um, their reproductive function. So, um, you know, we talk about both offering hope on the front end and then efforts to restore hope after their treatment has been successful when it comes to reproduction. We are very uh, fortunate at UAB to take a team approach to the care of not only reproduction, but also to cancer. And, and we do try to address all the aspects, the emotional, the ethical, the relationships, uh, faith and finances all rolled into one. We work closely with our oncology colleagues uh, to um, identify patients who are at risk for losing their reproductive potential and are interested in, in getting further information. So first and foremost, we rely on not only their skill as physicians and their success in treating the cancer, but also um, their insight into who, who might benefit most from um, fertility uh, preservation. We then, after our initial consult, go back to our oncology colleagues and ask the question, is this safe for this patient? And it is appropriate given their, their entire medical picture. The data is very compelling that even in very hormone sensitive cancers like breast cancer, that pregnancy um, at the very least has no negative impact um, and may, and it has been suggested, may be beneficial for in limiting recurrence of disease. So when I counsel patients, I'm able to reassure them that pregnancy after hormone sensitive cancers like breast cancer does not have a negative impact on their recurrence of the disease or their survival, and has even, it's even been suggested in some studies that pregnancy may be beneficial um, to their long-term health. Jessica's case is really a prime example of a woman's persistence um, and her desire to be a mom and, um, and was very fortunate to be a part of that, um, to give her hope on the front end, even though she was facing the recent uh, breast cancer diagnosis. And, um, it's especially satisfying for me and my team to now see the end results of our efforts and makes us um, even more committed to fertility preservation um, and even more um, thankful that we are a part of a, a great institution like UAB that's really at the forefront of technology um, of treating the whole person, um, not just treating their cancer.